Metamorphosis by Ovid, Book Two. Translated by Sir Samuel Garth, John Dryden, et al. The Story of Phaeton. The sun's bright palace on high columns raised, with burnished gold and flaming jewels blazed, the folding gates diffused a silver light, and with a milder gleam refreshed the sight. Of polished ivory was the covering wrought, the matter vied not what the sculptors thought, for in the portal was displayed on high the work of Vulcan, a fictitious sky. A waving sea the inferior earth embraced, and gods and goddesses the waters graced. Aegean here, a mighty whale bestrode, Triton and Proteus the deceiving god, with Doris here were carved in all her train, some loosely swimming in the figured main. While some on the rocks their dropping hair divide, and some on fishes through the waters glide, though various features did the sisters grace, a sister's likeness was in every face. On earth, a different landscape courts the eyes. Men, towns, and beasts in distant prospects rise, and nymphs and streams and woods and rural deities. Over all, the heaven refulgent image shines. On either gate were six engraven signs. Here, Phaeton, still gaining on the ascent, to his suspected father's palace went, till pressing forward through the bright abode, he saw at a distance the illustrious god. He saw at a distance, or the dazzling light, had flashed too strongly on his a king sight. The god sits high, exalted on a throne of blazing gems with purple garments on. The hours in order ranged on either hand, and days and months and years and ages stand. Here spring appears with flowery chaplets bound. Here summer in her wheaten garland crowned. Here autumn the rich trodden grapes besmear, and hoary winter shivers in the rear. Phoebus beheld the youth from off his throne, that eye which looks on all was fixed in one. He saw the boy's confusion in his face, surprised at all the wonders of the place, and cries aloud, What wants my son? For know my son thou art, and I must call thee so. Light of the world, the trembling youth replies, illustrious parent, since you don't despise the parent's name, some certain token give, that I may cly means, proud boast believe, nor longer under false reproaches grieve. The tender sire was touched with what he said, and flung the blaze of glories from his head, and bid the youth advance. My son, he said, come to thy father's arms, for cly mean has told thee true. A parent's name I own, and deem thee worthy to be called my son, as a sure proof, make some request, and I, whatever it be, with that request comply. By sticks I swear, whose waves are hid in night, and rowl impervious to my piercing sight. The youth transported asks without delay, to guide the sun's bright chariot for a day. The god repented of the oath he took, for anguish thrice his radiant head he shook. My son, he says, some other proof require. Rash was my promise, rash is thy desire. I'd fain deny this wish which thou hast made, or what I can't deny would fain dissuade. Too vast and hazardous the task appears, nor suited to thy strength, nor to thy years. Thy lot is mortal, but thy wishes fly beyond the province of mortality. There's not one of the, all the gods that dares, however skilled in other great affairs, to mount the burning axle tree, but I, not Jove himself, the ruler of the sky, that hurls the three forked thunder from above, dares try his strength. Yet who so strong as Jove? The steeds climb up the first ascent with pain, and when the middle firmament they gain, if downward from the heavens my head I bow, I see the earth and ocean hang below. Even I am seized with horror and affright, and my own heart misgives me at the sight. A mighty downfall steeps the evening stage, and steady rains must curb the horse's rage. Tethys herself is feared to see me driving down headlong from the precipice of heaven. Besides, consider what impetuous force turns stars and planets in a different course. I steer against their motions, nor am I borne back by all the current of the sky. But how could you resist the orbs that rowl in adverse whirls and stem the rapid pole? But you perhaps may hope for pleasing woods and stately dooms and cities filled with gods, while through a thousand snares your progress lies where forms of starry monsters stalk the skies. 
for, should you hit the doubtful way right, the bull with stooping horn stands opposite. Next him, the bright harmonian bow is strung, and next the lion's grinning visage hung. The scorpion's claws here clasp a wide extent, and here the crabs in lesser clasps are bent. Nor would you find it easier to compose the meddled steeds when from their nostrils flows the scorching fire that in their entrail glows. Even I, their headstrong fury scarce restrain when they grow warm and restive to the rain. Let not my son a fatal gift require, but, oh, in time, recall your rash desire. You may ask a gift that may your parent tell, let these my fears your parentage reveal, and learn a father from a father's care. Look on my face, or if my heart lay bare, could you but look, you'd read the father there. Choose out a gift from seas or earth or skies, for open to your wish all nature lies, only decline this one unequal task. For tis a mischief, not a gift, you ask. You ask a real mischief, Phaeton. Nay, hang not thus about my neck, my son. I grant your wish, and Styx has heard my voice. Choose what you will, but make a wiser choice. Thus did the god the unwary youth advise, but he still longs to travel through the skies. When the fond father, for in vain he pleads, at length through the Vulcanian chariot leads, a golden axle did the work uphold. Gold was the beam, the wheels were orbed with gold. The spokes in rows of silver pleased the sight, the seat with party-colored gems was bright. Apollo shined amid the glare of light, the youth with secret joy the work surveys. When now the moon disclosed her purple rays, the stars were fled, for Lucifer had chased the stars away, and fled himself at last. Soon, as the father saw the rosy morn, and the moon shining with a blunter horn, he bid the nimble hours without delay bring forth the steeds the nimble hours obey. From their full racks the generous steeds retire, dropping ambrosial foams and snorting fire. Still anxious for his son, the god of day, to make him proof against the burning ray, his temples with celestial ointment wet, of sovereign virtue to repel the heat, then fixed the beamy circle on his head, and fetched a deep foreboding sigh, and said, Take this at least, this last advice, my son. Keep a stiff rein, and move but gently on. The coursers of themselves will run too fast. Your art must be to moderate their haste. Drive them not on directly through the skies, but where the zodiac winding circle lies. Along the midmost zone, but sally forth not to the distant south, nor stormy north. The horse's hooves a beaten track will show, but neither mount too high nor sink too low, that no new fires or heaven or earth invest. Keep the midway, the middle way is best. Nor where in radiant fold the serpent twines direct your course, nor where the altar shines shun both extremes. The rest let fortune guide, and better for thee than thyself provide. See, while I speak, the shades disperse away. Aurora gives the promise of a day. I'm called, nor can I make a longer stay, snatch up thy reins, or still the attempt forsake. And not my chariot, but my counsel take. Yet, while securely on the earth you stand, nor touch the horses with too rash a hand, let me alone to light the world while you enjoy these beams which you may safely view. He spoke in vain. The youth with active heat and sprightly vigor vaults into the seat and joys to hold the reins and fondly gives those thanks his father with remorse receives. Meanwhile, the restless horses neighed aloud, breathing out fire, and pawing where they stood. Tethys, not knowing what had passed, gave way, and all the waste of heaven before them lay. They spring together out, and swiftly bear the flying youth through clouds and yielding air. With wingy speed outstrip the eastern wind, and leave the breezes of the morn behind. The youth was light, nor could he feel the seat or poise, the chariot with its wonted weight. But as the sea the unballast vessel rides, cast to and fro, the sport of winds and tides. So, in the bounding chariot tossed on high, the youth is hurried headlong through the sky. Soon as the steeds perceive it, they forsake their stated course and leave the beaten track. 
The youth was in a maze, nor did he know which way to turn the reins, or where to go, nor would the horses, had he known, obey. Then the seven stars first felt Apollo's ray, and wished to dip in the forbidden sea. The folded serpent next, the frozen pole, stiff and benumbed before, began to row, and raged with inward heat and threatened war, and shot a redder light from every star. Nay, and tis, said Boots, too, that fain thou wouldst have fled, thou cumbered with thy wain. The unhappy youth then, bending down his head, saw earth and ocean far beneath him spread. His color changed, he startled at the sight, and his eyes darkened by too great a light. Now could he wish the fiery steeds untried, his birth obscure and his request denied. Now would he me robs for his father's own, and quit his boasted kindred to the sun. So fares the pilot when his ship is tossed in troubled seas and all its steerage lost. He gives her to the winds and in despair seeks his last refuge in the gods and prayer. What could he do? His eyes, if backward cast, find a long path he had already passed. If forward, still a longer path they find. Both he compares and measures in his mind and sometimes casts an eye upon the east and sometimes looks on the forbidden west. The horse's names he knew not in the fright, nor would he loose the reins, nor could he hold them right. Now all the horrors of the heavens he spies, and monstrous shadows of prodigious size that decked with stars lie scattered o'er the skies. There's a place above where Scorpio bent in tail and arm surrounds a vast extent. In a wide circuit of the heavens he shines and fills the space of two celestial signs. Soon, as the youth beheld him vexed with heat, brandish his sting and in his poison sweat, half dead with sudden fear he dropped the reins. The horses felt them loose upon their manes and, flying out through all the plains above, ran uncontrolled wherever their fury drove, rushed on the stars and through a pathless way of unknown regions, hurried on the day, and now above and now below they flew, and near the earth the burning chariot drew. The clouds disperse and fumes, the wandering moon beholds her brother's steeds beneath her own, the highland smoke cleft by the piercing rays, or clad with woods in their own fuel blaze. Next, o'er the plains where ripened harvests grow, the, run the running conflagration spreads below. But these are trivial ills. Whole cities burn, unpeopled kingdoms into ashes turn. The mountains kindle as the car draws near. Athos and Molos, red with fires, appear. Agrian Amos, then a single name, and virgin Helicon increase the flame. Taurus and Oate glare amid the sky, and Ida, spite of all her fountains, dry. Eryx and Othris and Sithorin glow and rode up no longer clothed in snow, high Pindus, Mimis, and Parnassus sweat, and Etna rages with redoubled heat, even Scythia, through her hoary regions warmed. In vain with all her native frost was armed, covered with flames the towering Apennine, and Caucasus and proud Olympus shine, and where the long-extended Alps aspire now stands a huge continued range fire. The astonished youth, wherever his eyes could turn, beheld the universe around him burn. The world was in a blaze, nor could he bear the sultry vapors and the scorching air from which below as from a furnace flowed. And now the axle tree beneath him glowed, lost in the whirling clouds that round him broke, and white with ashes hovering in the smoke. He flew wherever the horses drove, nor knew whether the horses drove or where he flew. "'Twas then, they say, the swarthy moor begun to change his hue and blacken in the sun. Then Libya, first of all her moisture drained, became a barren waste, a wild of sand. The water nymphs lament their empty urns. Boeotia robs of silver, dirsh, mourns. Corinth, Pyrenees, wasted spring, bewails. And Argos grieves whilst anemone fails. The floods are drained from every distant coast, even Tanis, 
though fixed in ice was loss. In rage, Cacus and Lacormus roar, and Xanthus faded to be burnt once more, and famed meander that unwearied strays through mazy winding smokes in every maze. From his loved Babylon, Euphrates flies. The big swollen Ganges and the Danube rise in thickening fumes and darken half the skies. In flames, Ismenos and the faces roiled. Antigas floating in his melted gold, the swans that uncased are often tried their tuneful songs, now sung their last and died. The frighted Nile ran off and underground, concealed his head, nor can it yet be found. His seven divided currents all are dry, and where they rode, seven gaping trenches lie. No more the Rhine nor Rome their course maintain, nor Tiber of his promised empire vain. The ground deep cleft admits the dazzling ray, and startles Pluto with the flash of day. The seas shrink in, and to the sight disclose wide naked plains, where once their billows rose. Their rocks are all discovered, and increase the number of the scattered Cyclades. The fish in shoals about the bottom creep. No longer dares the crooked dolphin leap, gasping for breath, the unshapen foci die. And on the boiling wave extended lie Nereus and Doris with her virgin train. Seek out the last recesses of the main, beneath unfathomable depths they faint, and secret in their gloomy caverns pant. Stern Neptune thrice above the waves upheld his face, and thrice was by the flames repelled. The earth at length, on every side embraced, with scalding seas that floated round her waist, when now she felt the springs and rivers come and crowd within the hollow of her womb, uplifted to the heavens her blasted head, and clapped her hand upon her brows and said, but first impatient of the sultry heat, sunk deeper down and sought a cooler seat. If you, great king of gods, my death approve, and I deserve it, let me die by Jove. If I must perish by the force of fire, let me transfixed with thunderbolts expire. For whilst I speak my breath, the vapors choke. For now her face lay wrapped in clouds of smoke. See my singed hair, behold my faded eye, and withered face where heaps of cinders lie. And does the plow for this my body tear, this the reward for all the fruits I bear, tortured with rakes and harassed all the year, that herbs for cattle daily I renew, and food for man and frankincense for you? But grant me guilty. What has Neptune done? Why are his waters boiling in the sun? The wavy empire which by lot was given, why does it waste and further shrink from heaven? If I, nor he, your pity can provoke, see your own heavens, the heavens begin to smoke. Should once the sparkles catch those bright abodes, destruction seizes on the heavens and gods. Atlas becomes unequal to his freight and almost faints beneath the glowing weight. If heaven and earth and sea together burn, all must again to their chaos turn. Apply some speedy cure, prevent our fate, and succor nature ere it be too late. She ceased, for choked with vapors round her spread, down to the deepest shade she sunk her head. Jove called to witness every power above, and even the god whose son the chariot drove, that what he acts, he is compelled to do. Our universal ruin must ensue. Straight he ascends the high ethereal throne, from whence he used to dart his thunder down, from whence his showers and storms he used to pour, but now could meet with neither storm nor shower. Then aiming at the youth with lifted hand, full at his head he hurled the forky bran in dreadful thunderings. Thus the almighty sire suppressed the raging of the fires with fire. At once from life and from the chariot driven, the ambitious boy fell thunderstruck from heaven. The horses started with a sudden bound and flung the reins and chariot to the ground. The studded harness from their necks they broke. Here fell a wheel, here a silver spoke. Here were the beam and axle torn away and scattered o'er the earth. The shining fragments lay, the breathless phaeton with flaming hair shot from the chariot like a falling star that in summer evening from the top of heaven drops down, or seems at least to drop, 
till on the Po his blasted corpse was hurled far from his country in the Western world. Phaeton cisterns transformed into trees. The Latian nymphs came round him, and amazed on the dead youth, transfixed with thunder, gazed. And, whilst yet smoking from the bolt he lay, his shattered body to a tomb convey, and o'er the tomb an epitaph devise. Here he who drove the sun's bright chariot lies. His father's fiery steeds he could not guide, but in the glorious enterprise he died. Apollo hid his face and pined for grief. And if the story may deserve belief, the space of one whole day is said to run from morn to wanted evening without a sun. The burning ruins with a fainter ray supply the sun and counterfeit a day, a day that still did nature's face disclose this comfort from the mighty mischief rose. But Clymene, enraged with grief, laments, and as her grief inspires, her passion vents, wild for her son and frantic in her woes, with her hair disheveled round the world she goes to seek wherever his body might be cast. Till on the borders of the Po at last the name inscribed on the new tomb appears, the dear, dear name she bathes in flowing tears, hangs o'er the tombs unable to depart, and hugs the marble to her throbbing heart. Her daughters too lament and sigh and mourn, a fruitless tribute to their brother's urn, and beat their naked bosoms and complain, and call aloud for Phaeton in vain. All the long night their mournful watch they keep, and all the day stand round the tomb and weep. Four times revolving the full moon returned, so long the mother and the daughters mourned, when now the eldest, Fethusa, strove to rest her weary limbs, but could not move. Lampisha would have helped her, but she found herself withheld and rooted to the ground. A third in wild affliction, as she grieves, would rend her hair, but fills her hands with leaves. One sees her thighs transformed, another views her arm shot out and branching into boughs. And now their legs and breasts and bodies stood, crusted with bark and hardening into wood. But still above were female heads displayed, and mouths that called the mother to their aid. What could, alas, the weeping mother do? From this to that, with eager haste she flew, and kissed her sprouting daughters as they grew. She tears the bark that to each body cleaves, and from their verdant fingers strips the leaves. The blood came trickling, where she tore away the leaves and bark. The maids were heard to say, Forbear, mistaken parent, oh, forbear. A wounded daughter in each tree you tear. Farewell forever. Here the bark increased closed on their faces, and their words suppressed. The new-made trees in tears of amber run, which harden into value by the sun, distill forever on the streams below, the limpid streams their radiant treasure show, mixed in the sand whence the rich drops conveyed, shine in the dress of the bright Latian maid. The transformation of sickness into a swan. Sickness beheld the nymphs transformed, allied to their dead brother on the mortal side, in friendship and affection near abound. He left the cities and the realms he owned, through pathless fields and lonely shores to range, and woods made thicker by the sisters' change. Whilst here, within the dismal gloom alone, the melancholy monarch made his moan. His voice was lessened as he tried to speak and issued through a long extended neck, his hair transformed to down, his fingers meet in skinny films and shape his oary feet. From both his sides the wings and feathers break, and from his mouth proceeds a blunted beak. All sickness now into a swan was turned, who, still remembering how his kinsmen burned, to solitary pools and lakes retires, and loves the waters as opposed to fires. Meanwhile, Apollo in a gloomy shade, the native luster of his brows decayed, indulging sorrow sickens at the sight of his own sunshine and abhors the light. The hidden griefs that in his bosom rise sadden his looks and overcast his eyes, as when some dusky orb obstructs his ray and sullies in a dim eclipse the day. Now secretly with inward griefs he pined, now warm resentments to his griefs he joined and now renounced his office to mankind, ere since the birth of times he, 
I've borne a long, ungrateful toil without return. Let now some other manage, if he dare, the fiery steeds and mount the burning car, or if none else, let Jove his fortune try and learn to lay his murdering thunder by. Then will he own, perhaps, but own too late, my son deserved not so severe a fate. The gods stand round him as he mourns, and pray he would resume the conduct of day, nor let the world be lost in endless night. Jove, too, himself descending from his height, excuses what had happened and entreats, majestically mixing prayers and threats. Prevailed upon at length, again he took the harness's steeds that still with horror shook, and plies him with the lash and whips him on, and as he whips, upbraids them with his son. The Story of Callisto the day was settled in its course, and Jove walked the wide circuit of the heavens above to search if any cracks or flaws were made, but all was safe. The earth he then surveyed and cast an eye on every different coast and every land, but on Arcadia most. Her fields he clothed and cheered her blasted face with running fountains and with springing grass. No tracks of heaven destructive fire remain. The fields and woods revive and nature smiles again. But as the god walked to and fro the earth, and raised the plants, and gave the spring its birth, by chance a fair Arcadian nymph he viewed, and felt the lovely charmer in his blood. The nymph nor spun nor dressed with artful pride, her vest was gathered up, her hair was tied. Now in her hand a slender spear she bore, now a light quiver on her shoulders wore. To chase Diana from her youth inclined, the sprightly warriors of the wood she joined. Diana, too, the gentle huntress loved. Nor was there one of all the nymphs that roved over Menelaus amid the maiden throng, more favored once, but favor lasts not long. The sun now shone in all its strength and drove the heated virgin panting to a grove. The grove around a grateful shadow cast. She dropped her arrows and her bow unbraced. She flung herself on the cool, grassy bed, and on the painted quiver raised her head. Jove saw the charming huntress unprepared, stretched on the verdant turf without a guard. Here I am safe, he cries from Juno's eye. Or should my jealous queen the theft descry, yet would I venture on a theft like this and stand her rage for such, for such a bliss. Diana's shape and habit straight he took, softened his brows and smoothed his awful look, and mildly in a female accent spoke, How fares my girl? How went the morning chase? To whom the virgin, starting from the grass, All oh, hail, bright deity, whom I prefer to Jove himself, though Jove himself was here. The god was nearer than she thought, and heard well pleased himself before himself preferred. He then salutes her with a warm embrace, and ere she half had told the morning chase with love inflamed and eager on his bliss, smothered her words and stopped her with a kiss. His kisses were unwanted ardor glowed, nor could Diana's shape conceal the god. The virgin did whatever a virgin could. Sure, Juno must have pardoned had she viewed. With all her might against his force she strove, but how can mortal maids contend with Jove? Possessed at length of what his heart desired, back to his heavens the exulting god retired, the lovely huntress rising from the grass, with downcast eyes and with a blushing face, by shame confounded and by fear dismayed, flew from the covert of the guilty shade, and almost in tumult of her mind left her forgotten bow and shafts behind. But now Diana, with a sprightly train of quivered virgins bounding o'er the plain, called to the nymph. The nymph began to fear a second fraud, a Jove disguised in her. But when she saw the sister, nymph suppressed her rising fears and mingled with the rest. How in the look does conscious guilt appear? Slowly she moved and loitered in the rear, nor lightly tripped nor by the goddess ran. At once she used the foremost of the train. Her looks were flushed, and sullen was her mien. That sure the virgin goddess, had she been aught but a virgin, must the guilt have seen. Tis said the nymph saw all and guessed aright, and now the moon had nine times lost her light, when Diane, fainting in the midday beams, found a cool covert and refreshing streams that in soft murmurs through the forest flowed, 
and a smooth bed of shining gravel showed. A covert so obscure and stream so clear, the goddess praised, and now no spies are near. Let's strip, my gentle maids, and wash, she cries. Pleased with the motion, every maid complies. Only the blushing huntress stood confused. Unformed delays, her delays excused. In vain excused, her fellows round her pressed, and the reluctant nymph by force undressed. The naked huntress of all her shame revealed. In vain her hands the pregnant womb concealed. Be gone! The goddess cries with stern disdain, Be God, nor dare the hallowed stream to stain. She fled, forever banished from the train. This Juno heard, who long had watched her time to punish the detested rival's crime. The time was come for her to enrage her more, a lovely boy the teeming rival bore. The goddess cast a furious eye and cried, It is enough! I'm fully satisfied this boy shall stand a living mark to prove my husband's baseness and the strumpet's love. But vengeance shall awake those guilty charms that drew the thunderer from Juno's arms. No longer shall their wanted force retain, nor please the god, nor make the mortal vain. This said, her hand within her hair she wound, swung her to earth and dragged her on the ground. The prostrate wretch lifts her up, arms in prayer. Her arms grow shaggy and deformed with hair. Her nails are sharpened into pointed claws. Her hands bear half her weight and turn to paws. Her lips that once could tempt a god begin to grow distorted in an ugly grin. Unless the supplicating brute might reach the ears of Jove, she was deprived of speech. Her surly voice through a hoarse passage came in savage sounds. Her mind was still the same, the furry monster fixed her eyes above and heaved her newly unwieldy paws to Jove and begged his aid with inward groans, and though she could not call him false, she thought him so. How did she fear to lodge in woods alone and haunt the fields and meadows once her own? How would the deep-mouthed dogs pursue whilst from her hounds the frighted huntress flew? How did she fear her fellow brutes and shun the shaggy bear, though now herself was one? How from the sight of rugged wolves retire, although the grim Lycon was her sire? But now her son had fifteen summers told, fierce at the chase and in the forest bold, when as he beat the woods in quest of prey, he chanced to rouse his mother where she lay. She knew her son and kept him in her sight and fondly gazed, the boy was in a fright, and aimed a pointed arrow at her breast, and would have slayed his mother in the beast. But Jove forbade, and snatched him through the air, in whirlwinds up to heaven, and fixed him there, where the new constellations nightly rise, and add a luster to the northern skies. When Juno saw the rival in her height, spangled with stars and circled around with light, she sought old ocean in his deep abodes, and Tethys, both revered among the gods, they ask what brings her there. Never ask, says she, what brings me here? Heaven is no place for me. You'll see when night has covered all things over, Jove's starry bastard and triumphant whore usurped the heavens. You'll see them proudly rowl, and who shall now on Juno's altars wait, when those she hates grow greater by her hate? I, on the nymph, a brutal form impress, Jove to a goddess has transformed the beast. This, this was all my weak revenge could do. But let the god his chaste amours pursue, and, as he acted after Io's rape, restore the adulteress to her former shape. Then he might cast his Juno off and lead the great Lycon's offspring to his bed. But you, ye venerable powers, be kind. And if my wrongs a due resentment find, receive not in your waves their settling beams, nor let the glaring strumpet taint your streams. The goddess ended, and her wish was given. Back she returned to triumph up to heaven. Her gaudy peacocks drew her through the skies. Their tails were spotted with a thousand eyes. The eyes of Argus on their tails were ranged. At the same time, the raven's color changed. The story of Cronus and birth of Esculapius. The raven, once in snowy plumes, was dressed, white as the whitest dove's unsullied breast. Fair as the guardian of the capital, soft as the swan, 
a large and lovely fowl. His tongue, his prating tongue, had changed him quite to sooty blackness from the purest white. The story of his change shall be told. In Thessaly there lived a nymph of old, Coronis named, a peerless maid she shined, confess the fairest of the fairer kind. Apollo loved her till her guilt he knew, while true she was or whilst he thought her true. But his own bird, the raven, chanced to find the false one with a secret rival joined. Coronis begged him to suppress the tale, but could not with repeated prayers prevail. His milk-white pinions to the god he plied. The busy daw flew with him side by side and by a thousand teasing questions drew the important secret from him as they flew. The dog gave honest counsel, though despised, and tedious in her tuttle thus advised. Stay, silly bird, thy ill-natured task refuse, nor be the bearer of unwelcome news. Be warned by my example, you discern what now I am, and what I was shall learn. My foolish honesty was all my crime, then hear my story, once upon a time, the two-shaped Erichthonius had his birth without a mother from the teeming earth. Minerva nursed him, and the infant laid within a chest of twining osiers made. The daughters of King Cecrops undertook to guard the chest, commanded not to look on what was hidden within. I stood to see the charge they obeyed, perched on a neighboring tree. The sisters, Pandrosos and Herse, keep the strict command. Agloros needs would peep, and saw the monstrous infant in a fright, and called her sisters to the hideous sight. A boy's soft shape did to the waist prevail, but the boy ended in a dragon's tail. I told the stern Minerva all that passed, but for my pains discarded and disgraced, the frowning goddess drove me from her sight, and for her favor chose the bird of night. Be then no tell-tale, for I think my wrong enough to teach a bird to hold her tongue. But you perhaps may think I was removed, as never by the heavenly maid beloved. But I was loved. Ask Pallas if I lie. Though Pallas hates me now, she won't deny, for I whom in a feathered shape you view, was once a maid by heaven, the story's true, a blooming maid and a king's daughter too. A crowd of lovers owned my beauty's charms. My beauty was the cause of all my harm. Neptune, as on his shores I want to rove, observed me in my walks and fell in love. He made his courtship, he confessed his pain, and offered force when all his arts were vain. Swift he pursued, I ran along the strand till spent and wearied, on the sinking sand I shrieked aloud, with cries I filled the air to gods and men, nor god nor man was there. A virgin goddess heard a virgin's prayer, for as my arms I lifted to the skies, I saw black feathers from my fingers rise. I strove to fling my garment on the ground, my garment turned to plumes and girt me round. My hands to beat my naked bosom try, nor naked bosom now, nor hands had I. Lightly I tripped, nor weary as before, sunk in the sand but skimmed along the shore, till rising on my wings I was preferred to the chaste Minerva's virgin bird, preferred in vain, I am now in disgrace. Nicetamine, the owl, enjoys my place. On her incestuous life I need not dwell. In Lesbos still the hard tale they tell. And of her dire moors you must have heard, for which she now does penance in a bird, that conscious of her shame avoids the light and loves the gloomy covering of the night. The birds, wherever she flutters, scare away the hooting wretch and drive her from the day. The raven, urged by such impertinence, grew passionate, it seems, and took offense, and cursed the harmless daw. The daw withdrew, and raven to her injured patron flew, and found him, and told the fatal truth of false Coronis and the favored youth. The god was wroth. The color left his look. The wreath his head, the harp his hand forsook. His silver bow and feathered shafts he took and lodged an arrow in the tender breast that so often to his own been pressed. 
Down fell the wounded nymph and sadly groaned, and pulled his arrow reeking from the wound, and weltering in her blood thus faintly cried, Ah, cruel God, though I have justly died, what has, alas, my unborn infant done, that he should fall and two expire in one? This said, in agony she fetched her breath. The god dissolves in pity at her death. He hates the bird that made her falsehood known, and hates himself for what himself had done. The feathered shaft that sent her to the fates, and his own hand that sent the shaft he hates. Fain would he heal the wound and ease her pain, and try the compass of his art in vain. Soon, as he saw the lovely nymph expire, the pile made ready and the kindling fire, with sighs and groans, her obsequies he kept. And if a god could weep, the god had wept. Her corpse he kissed, and heavenly incense brought, and solemnized the death himself had wrought. But lest his offspring should her fate partake, spite of the immortal mixture in his make, he ripped her womb, and set the child at large, and gave him to the centaur, Chiron's charge, then in his fury blacked the raven o'er, and bid him prate in his white plumes no more. Osiro transformed into a mare. Old Chiron took the babe with secret joy, proud of the charge of the celestial boy, his daughter too, whom on the sandy shore the nymph Caracling to the centaur bore. With hair disheveled on her shoulders came to see the child. Osiro was her name. She knew her father's arts and could rehearse the depths of prophecy in sounding verse. Once, as the sacred infant she surveyed, the god was kindled in the raving maid, and thus she uttered her prophetic tale. Hail, great physician of the world, all hail, hail, mighty infant, who in years to come shalt to heal the nations and defraud the tomb. Swift be thy growth, thy triumphs unconfined. Make kingdoms thicker and increase mankind. Thy daring art shall animate the dead and shall draw the thunder on thy guilty head. Then shalt thou die, but from the dark abode rise up victorious and be twice a god. And thou, my sire, not destined by thy birth to turn to dust and mix with common earth, how wilt thou loss and rave and long to die and quit thy claim to immortality when thou shalt feel enraged with inward pains the hydra's venom rankling in thy veins? The gods in pity shall contract thy date and give thee over to the power of fate. Thus, entering into destiny, the maid the secrets of offended Jove betrayed. More had she still to say, but now appears oppressed with sobs and sighs, and drowned in tears. My voice, says she, is, is gone. My language fails. Through every limb my kindred shape prevails. Why did the god this fatal gift impart, and with prophetic rapture swell my heart? What new desires are these? I long to pace over flowery meadows, and to feed on grass. I hasten to a brute, a maid no more. But why, alas, am I transformed all over? My sire does half a human shape retain, and in his upper parts preserve the man. Her tongue no more distinct complaints affords, but in shrill accents and misshapen words pours forth such hideous wailings as declare the human form confounded in the mare, till by degrees accomplished in the beast she neighed outright and all the steed expressed. Her stooping body on her hands is borne. Her hands are turned to hoofs and shod in horn. Her yellow tresses ruffle in a mane and in a flowing tail she frisks her mane. The mare was finished in her voice and look, and a new name from the new figure took. The transformation of Battus to a touchstone. Sore wept the centaur, and to Phoebus prayed, but how could Phoebus give the centaur aid? Degraded of his power by angry Jove, in Elis then a herd of beeves he drove, and wielded in his hand a staff of oak and o'er his shoulders threw the shepherd's cloak. 
On seven compacted reeds he used to play, and on his rural pipe to waste the day. At once attentive to his pipe he played, the crafty Hermes from the god conveyed a drove that separate from their fellows strayed. The theft of an old insidious peasant viewed. They called him Battus in the neighborhood, hired by a wealthy Pylian prince to feed his favorite mares and watch the generous breed. The thievish god suspected him and took the hind aside and thus in whispers spoke, discovered not the theft, whoever thou be, and take that milk-white heifer for thy fee. Go, stranger, cries the clown, securely on that stone shall sooner tell, and showed a stone. The god withdrew, but straight returned again in speech and habit like a country swain, and cries out, Neighbor, hast thou seen a stray of bullocks and of heifers pass this way? In the recovery of my cattle join, a bullock and a heifer shall be thine. The peasant quick replies, you'll find them there in yon dark vale, and in the vale they were. The double bribe had his false heart beguiled, the god successful in the trial smiled. And dost thou thus betray myself to me? Me to myself dost thou betray, says he, then to a touchstone turns the faithless by, and in his name records his infamy. The story of a gloros transformed into a statue. This done, the god flew up on high and passed over lofty Athens by Minerva graced and wide Munuchia, whilst his eyes survey all the vast region that beneath him lay. T'was now the feast when each Athenian maid her yearly homage to Minerva paid. In canisters with garlands covered over, high on their heads, their mystic gifts they bore, and now, returning in a solemn train, the troop of shining virgins filled the plain. The gods well pleased beheld the pompous show, and saw the bright procession pass below, then veered about and took a wheeling flight, and hovered over them as the spreading kite that smells the slaughtered victim from on high flies at a distance, if the priests are nigh, and sails around and keeps in it her eye. So kept the god the virgin choir in view, and in slow winding circles around them flew. As Lucifer excels the meanest star, or as the full-orbed Phoebe, Lucifer, so much did hearse all the rest out vie, and gave a grace to the solemnity. Hermes was fired, as in the clouds he hung, so the cold bullet that with fury slung from Balarek engines mounts on high, glows in the whirl and burns along the sky. At length, he pitched along the ground and showed the form divine, the features of a god. He knew their virtue over a female heart, and yet he strives to better them by art. He hangs his mantle loose and sets to show the golden edging on the seam below, adjusting his flowing curls and in his hand waves with an air the sleep procuring wand, the glittering sandals to his feet applies, and to each heel the well-trimmed pinion ties, his ornaments with nicest art displayed, he seeks the apartment of the royal maid, the roof was all with polish ivory lined, that richly mixed in clouds of tortoise shined, three rooms contiguous in a range were placed, the midmost by the beauteous hearse graced, her virgin sisters lodged on either side, a gloros first the approaching god descried, and as he crossed her chamber asked his name, and what his business was, and whence he came. I come, replied the god, from heaven, to woo your sister, and to make an aunt of you. I am the son and messenger of Jove, my name is Mercury, my business love. Do you, kind damsel, take a lover's part, and gain admittance to your sister's heart? She stared him in the face with looks amazed, and then she on Minerva's secret gazed, and asks a mighty treasure for her hire. Until he brings it makes the god retire. Minerva grieved to see the nymph succeed, and now remembering the late impious deed, when disobedient to her strict command, she touched the chest with an unhallowed hand. In big, swollen sighs, her inward rage expressed that heaved the rising Aegeus on her breast. 
then sought out envy in her dark abode, defiled with ropey gore and clots of blood, shut from the winds and from the wholesome skies. In a deep veil the gloomy dungeon lies, dismal and cold, where not a beam of light invades the winter or disturbs the night. Directly to the cave her course she steered, against the gates her martial lance she reared. The gates flew open, and the fiend appeared. A poisonous morsel in her teeth she chewed, and gorged the flesh of vipers for her food. Minerva's loathing turned away her eye. The hideous monster, rising heavily, came stalking forward with a sullen pace, and left her mangled offals on the place. Soon as she saw the goddess gay and bright, she fetched a groan at such a cheerful sight. Livid and meager were her looks, her eye and foul distorted glances turned her eye. A horde of gall her inward parts possessed, and spread a greenness over her cankered breast. Her teeth were brown with rust, and from her tongue in dangling drops the stringy poison hung. She never smiles, but when the wretched weep, nor lulls her malice with a moment's sleep, Restless in spite while watchful to destroy, she pines and sickens at another's joy. Foe to herself, distressing and distressed, she bears her own tormentor in her breast. The goddess gave, for she abhorred her sight, a short command. To Athens speed thy light. On cursed Agloros try thy utmost art, and fix thy rankest venoms in her heart. This said, her spear she pushed against the ground, and mounting from it with an active bound, flew off to heaven. The hag, with eyes askew, looked up, and muttered curses as she flew, for sore she fretted and began to grieve at the success which she herself must give. Then takes her staff, hung round with wreaths of thorn, and sails along in a black whirlwind borne over fields and flowery meadows where she steers her baneful course. A mighty blast appears, mildew and blights. The meadows are defaced, the fields, the flowers, and the whole year's laid waste. On mortals next and people town she falls and breathes a burning plague among their walls. When Athens she beheld, her arts renowned. With peace made happy and with plenty crowned. Scarce could the hideous fiend from tears forbear To find out nothing that deserved a tear. The apartment now she entered where at rest A glorious lay with gentle sleep oppressed. To execute Minerva's dire command She stroked the virgin with her cankered hand, Then prickly thorns into her breast conveyed That stung to madness the devoted maid. Her subtle venom still improves the smart, Frets in the blood and festers in the heart. To make the work more sure, a scene she drew and placed before the dreaming virgin's view her sister's marriage and her glorious fate. The imaginary bride appears in state. The bridegroom with unwanted beauty glows, for envy magnifies whatever she shows. Full of the dream, a glorious pined away in tears all night, in darkness all the day, consumed like ice that just begins to run when feebly smitten by the distant sun, or like unwholesome weeds that set on fire are slowly wasted and in smoke expire. Given up to envy, for in every thought the thorns, the venom, and the vision wrought, oft did she call on death as oft decreed, rather than see her sister's wish succeed, to tell her awful father what had passed, at length before the door herself she cast, and sitting on the ground with sullen pride, a passage to the lovesick god denied. The god caressed, and for admission prayed, and soothed in softest words the envenomed maid. In vain, he soothed. Be gone, the maid replies, or here I keep my seat and never rise. Then keep thy seat forever, cries the god, and touch the door wide opening to his rod. Fain would she rise and stop him, but she found her trunk too heavy to forsake the ground. Her joints are all benumbed, her hands are pale, and marble now appears in every nail. And when a cancer in the body feeds, and gradual death from limb to limb proceeds, so does the chillness to each vital part spread by degrees and creeps into her heart. Till hardening everywhere and speechless groan, she sits unmoved and freezes to a stone. But still, 
Her envious hue and sullen mane are in the sedentary figure scene. Europa's Rape. When now the god his fury had allayed and taken vengeance of the stubborn maid, from where the bright Athenian turrets rise, he mounts aloft and reascends the skies. Jove saw him enter the sublime abodes, and as he mixed among the crowd of gods, beckoned him out and drew him from the rest, and in soft whispers thus his will expressed. My trusty Hermes, by whose ready aid thy sire's commands are through the world conveyed, resume thy wings, exert their utmost force, and to the walls of Sidon speed thy course. There find a herd of heifers wandering o'er the neighboring hill and drive them to the shore. Thus spoke the god, concealing his intent. The trusty Hermes on his message went, and found the herd of heifers wandering o'er a neighboring hill and drove them to the shore, where the king's daughter with a lovely train of fellow nymphs was sporting on the plain. The dignity of empire laid aside, for love but ill agrees with kingly pride, the ruler of the skies, the thundering god who shakes the world's foundations with a nod, among a herd of lowing heifers ran, frisked in a bull, and bellowed o'er the plain. Large rolls of fat above his shoulders clung, and from his neck the double dewlap hung. His skin was whiter than the snow that lies, unsullied by the breath of southern skies. Small shining horns on his curled forehead stand, as turned and polished by the workman's hand. His eyeballs rolled, not formidably bright, but gazed and languished with a gentle light. His every look was peaceful and expressed the softness of the lover in the beast. Agenor's royal daughter, as she played among the fields, the milk-white bull surveyed, and viewed his spotless body with delight, and at a distance kept him in her sight. At length she plucked the rising flowers and fed the gentle beast, and fondly stroked his head. He stood well pleased to touch the charming fair, but hardly could confine his pleasure there. And now he wantons over the neighboring stand, now rolls his body on the yellow sand, and now, perceiving all her fears decayed, comes tossing forward to the royal maid, gives her his breast to stroke, and downward turns his grisly brow, and gently stoops his horns. In flowery wreaths the royal virgin dressed his bending horns, and kindly clapped his breast. Till now grow wanton and devoid of fear, not knowing that she pressed the thunderer, she placed herself upon his back and rode over fields and meadows, seated on the god. He marched along, and by degrees left the dry meadow and approached the seas, where now he dips his hoofs and wets his thighs, now plunges in and carries off the prize. The frighted maid looked backward on the shore, and hears the tumbling billows round her roar, but still she holds him fast. One hand is borne upon his back, the other grasps a horn. Her train of ruffling garments flies behind, swells in the air and hovers in the wind. Through storms and tempests he the virgin bore, and lands her safe on the Dictian shore, where now in his divinest form arrayed, in his true shape he captivates the maid, who gazes on him and with wondering eyes beholds the new majestic figure rise, his glowing features and celestial light, and all the god discovered to her sight.'